So I recently read the Percy Jackson series and I loved it. I am, oh my goodness, I had the best time. I had the best time reading this series. It was so much fun and I'm so impressed with how well it was written. So this video, I just wanna talk a little bit about why I think this series works so well with a fandom that is so large and passionate and devoted. There's something here that makes it work so well for so many people. And I wanna talk about why I think that is and why I have loved it. So this is going to be spoiler free, but if you want more of my thoughts on each individual book, I do have a second channel where I post reading vlogs uh, as I read through things. So I will have that linked in the description. I have several videos where I was reading through these books, so you know, check that out if you want that. By the time this video goes up, the reading vlog with my fifth book, reactions, thoughts, isn't up yet, but it'll be up soon. So there are a lot of reasons why I think the series succeeds so much in so, people, so many people's minds, but I'm going to first talk, the first thing that I talk about is going to be the first thing that we're introduced to, and that's the narrative voice. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom or dad told you about your birth and try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time, it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid reading this because you think it's fiction, great, read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside, stop reading immediately. You might be one of us. And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too, and they'll come for you. Don't say I didn't warn you. This entire series has this amazing narrative voice where Percy is telling his story, but he's telling it after the fact. So there's little drops of breaking that fourth wall of him uh, talking about things in retrospect, but for the most part, the narrative voice is, is kind of in the background. For the most part, Percy telling his own story, you kind of forget that he is and you're just fully immersed and engaged in the story. But every now and then he pops back out of that of that narrative and he and he chats with us a little bit. And the way that it's done is so engaging and so unique to this story and so much fun. Not to say no other story does this, but the the way it's done is unique to this story. So the baseline setup for this story is that we're following a group of kids who are demigods. And what that means is that one of your parents is one of the Greek gods and one of your parents is a mortal. So you're half god. And with this, you are a lot more strong, a lot more powerful, but you also have a um, target on your back where Evil creatures uh, seek you out to kill you because they can sense what you are. So being being a demigod, it's a dangerous life, but uh, it's also a really, really exciting one. And with Percy, we first meet him when he doesn't actually know that he's a demigod and he's just gone through life kind of being the problem child. Uh, he gets expelled from school after school. He's always getting into trouble. He's always causing problems. And because he has ADD and uh, dyslexia, he also really has trouble with school. Quickly into the first book, he learns that he is a half-god and that he needs to get to Camp Half-Blood in order to survive because <laughs> there are creatures out to get him and also to train up and learn how to be what he is meant to be. He also learns that these learning disabilities that he has are actually something that all half-bloods have because they are their brains are hardwired to read Greek and not English or whatever language that they're reading. So that's why they have such a hard time focusing or deciphering words a lot of times, which is super cool. I really, really love that. If you don't already know, I'm dyslexic and I love this concept. I know that if I had read the series when I was a kid and I was struggling so hard, loved books, but could not pass a reading test to save my life. And I had this 
narrative presented to me that the reason you struggle so much with one of your favorite things in the world and the reason you always get bad, bad marks on your favorite thing is because you're a demigod, because there's something different about you that opens up a whole new world to you. How cool is that? That's awesome. Anyway, back to Percy. So. That's the setup for the story. That's the setup for how we're introduced to Percy. Percy is th the best boy. He has this dry humor that is all throughout this entire series. This entire series is painted, it's coated in so much humor. That's so much fun. Not just with Percy and the way he looks at life and the way he responds to things. It's not over the top. I've read some stories that have a very dry humor that's just constant. The character can't take anything seriously and it drives me nuts. Percy takes things very seriously and he really evaluates situations and he really does his best by the people in his his life and by the situations he's put in. But at the same time, he also has this humor throughout everything that's just sprinkled in at the exact right amount. It's wonderful. But he's not whiny. He's not full of himself. He's not bland. He's full of personality and he's full of flaws, but they just feel like real flaws instead of insert flaw here. And he will generally put all of himself into these quests that he's given, into helping people into saving people into trying to do what he what he believes is best but he's also faced with so many obstacles both physical and mental as well as confronted with i don't really know what the right thing to do here is so i just have to trust the people around me and do my best he's caring and kind and brave and strong and fails and He's a fantastic protagonist to follow. But it's not just Percy that makes these books. He has this very close-knit group of friends that are just as significant to his successes, to the story. They have just as much personality and character put into them as he does. Annabeth, who is proud and strong and who has something to prove to the world, is also extremely cunning and smart and brave. And her knowledge and her tenacity is just as significant to us moving forward as Percy's qualities are. Grover is timid and shy and scared, but has a dream that he really believes in and will face all of his fears and will face everything that he doesn't want to do if it means getting to the person that he's desperate to get to. And the final core member of our group, I shouldn't say because he isn't introduced until book two, but I will say that I love that he ends up being a core member of the group. When I first read book two, which I didn't love, I was frustrated by this character simply because it seemed obvious to me that he was a one-off character. He was here for the plot of the story, and then we wouldn't really talk about him again. And I was really, really wrong. And I love that it worked out this way because he is a character that is a species that is that generally ha is looked down upon a lot in this world and that has a lot of uh, preconceived ideals about. And I just thought that he was gonna fit into that category. We were gonna interact with him, we were gonna move on. But it turns out that Percy develops a deep, deep bond with him and breaks through those barriers and breaks through those ideas of the world. And it ends up being, he ends up being an amazing character for this series. Keeping on track with the characters, I love how present, positive, and loving adults are in this series. Percy's mom is kind and patient and loving and sacrifices so much to keep Percy safe. But she's also strong and independent and and wise and there's there's this one scene where Percy needs her blessing and she's like I, you're my son and you're about to do something so dangerous how can I give you my blessing in this and she's so supportive and understanding of this situation that Percy's in and so so caring and and there for him around every corner but at the same time she's his mom and she still struggles with how much danger he's put in every single day she's aware of of who percy is and and what's needed of him and she loves that he's rising to this call but she's still his mom and and their bond and their relationship and the way percy views her is so beautiful and i understand that it's easier to have 
bad or non-present or dead parents when you're writing a story about kids doing dangerous things and not having parents stand in their way. But I love that what Rick did instead is he created sometimes terrible adult influences. Sometimes there were people, sometimes there were gods, who were horrible, big roadblocks, bad, bad people. But sometimes, a lot of times, we were surrounded by parents and by uh, camp counselors at Camp Half-Blood and um, just people that truly cared, but also just understood what our characters needed to do and stood by them instead of just being removed from the equation. We even have one character, one very relevant character who has a dad and a stepmom and her feelings surrounding the family dynamic are really complicated, but it's still shown, that, compli that complicated family relationship is shown really honestly, but it's also, um, it's also really caring and it's also beautiful in its own messy way. And I think that actually, I think that actually describes a lot of stuff that I would like to say about this series is that there's a lot of convenient, easy, tropey ways that things are done. And I understand why they're done this way. A lot of times for books meant for kids or for teens. And I don't begrudge those things. I understand that it's just easier to remove parents from the equation or to handle a thing a certain way. And this series oftentimes just doesn't do it that way. It finds a way to do it differently and still make it work so well. Speaking about the way things are executed, let's talk about the plot execution because while not everything works, and while I've said this before, the story can be very episodic and formulaic, and I understand that, that Greek myths are very episodic, but um, there are, especially within the first three books, it follows the same structure, different, different variables, but the same structure, which makes it feel almost stale. Um, by the end, or at least for me it did. By the time I got through book two, I felt like, okay, we just did the same thing, or we did, we did something similar as far as the overarching structure, but it was less awesome. And then book three, it was more awesome, but still we're doing a similar thing here. And then book four, we kept the heart of what the story is, but we switched things up. Plus, as far as the world and the way things are executed, every now and then there are some in in inconsistencies or the things that don't work. It's not a perfect series. But all that said, it's an awesome series. In this plot of um, our characters who are having to face monsters and who are, have they have these quests that they have to go on, they get these prophecies that they have to fight for, they have to work with or against these gods that are not supposed to interfere, but sometimes they do. And we have this impending doom over us for a long time and, uh, but also there are very real sacrifices that happen in this story. There's long lasting consequences to terrible things that happen. Real stakes. We're facing off against terrible, uh, we're, we're facing off against things that are clearly much, much stronger than us. And, and it's not, it doesn't, the stakes are real. We have real loss. And we have real exploration of that loss. I think I remember the first time I read the series, one of my complaints in book one was that I didn't feel a certain loss was explored enough. And um, I will say that moving on into the other books, that is not a complaint that I have. Real emotions are explored, real complex situations and difficulties and insecurities are faced head on in this series. Um, we, we experience loss, as I said, but it's not just the exploration of the loss of losing someone, which we get, but it's also the exploration of the loss of losing someone to their own choices, to their own own decisions to their own path in life and they're just they're not who they once were and and you're losing them in those choices and the grief and the pain and the difficulty that comes with that we explore grief community identity finding yourself feeling alone and finding your place in life these characters feel like they're written 
as real people. It doesn't feel cardboard. It doesn't feel manufactured. They don't feel older than they should be or dumber than they should be to convenience plot. They're, they're real authentic characters that are so much fun to follow that are actually going through the process of growing up and finding yourself. Okay, enough about characters and all that. Let's talk about the world because that's another place where the story absolutely excels. So this world is based on Greek mythology. We interact with a lot of ancient Greek gods. Um, we get their basic structure, you know, like Athena is the god of wisdom. So she's full of wisdom. We have the god of war. We have the god of the oceans, the god of the sky, the god of death, right? So we have all the things, but even though Rick honors the original, what they are, what their niche is, and what their story was. And you can tell he did extensive research on this, and it's clearly something that he's very passionate about. But he also adds unique personalities to each of them, where there's certain things, certain ways that they affect the world, certain ways that certain parts of the world that they embrace or reject, certain ways that they like to meddle because of their personality, their unique humor, um, stiffness, uprightness, or uh, laid back and and uh, nonchalance. There's there's so many different personalities on each individual god that we interact with and they're not just again this cardboard um idea of what is already presented to us he takes what's presented honors it and then makes it fun and interactive and immersive but also the way the gods interact with the world is the same way um the way they explain where the gods where you look at Greek mythology and Roman mythology and all these different things that are similar but different and how it all connects and how they've moved across the world and over over centuries and how you can see their touch everywhere. Talking about um, colosseums and, and, and pillars and statues and tapestries where they're everywhere, all pr ever, ever present. And it's because they've had, they've been all throughout history and they've had their touch on history in all these different ways. And it's such a tangible thing that it actually feels like, okay, I, we could do this. Like we could, we could step into this world and it, it just feels, it doesn't feel like we're stepping out of our world to get to these books. It's right here. And, and he makes it make sense. And there's definitely, there's a lot of skill that goes into taking something like Greek mythology that has firm roots, a firm foundation, a strong base that is interwoven and complex and there's so much to it. And he can present it to you in a way that's totally easy to understand. You could come into these stories with no knowledge on these myths and still be able to easily pick up and process everything that he's talking about, while at the same time making it feel completely tangible and like, okay, I can actually step into this world. This makes sense to me and it feels like, yeah, this could be a part of what's around me for real. Making it so detailed and rich and complex while also being so accessible and easy to understand, there's a certain skill that goes into that and Rick kills it. He kills it. I'm also just gonna briefly touch on the romance in this series because it's not it doesn't take over. It's barely there throughout the majority of the series, but it's this very slow build up that, um, I guess I'll just say this, in a world riddled with insta-love, this is a partnership. This is something that has a firm foundation, that's deep, that is earned, and that is so satisfying. I could go on. There's so much that, <laughs> there's so much that I could, still talk about, but there's a couple, just, just give me like two more, give me two more things. There's so much pulling away from expectations in this series. There's so many times where we think, okay, this is what's expected of our heroes. This is what they have to do. But we're faced with so many trials and difficulties throughout this story where the characters really just have to figure out what's right in the moment. And this is a story where being a hero doesn't mean just saving everyone and being the biggest and baddest and most powerful and doing the most and having the the most pure of heart. In this story, sometimes being a hero means working toward the greater good and empowering people to save themselves and having and have a hand in their own redemption. It's not straightforward and simple. It's complex and it's difficult and it's messy. 
and that's a big part of what makes it so satisfying. It's a world that is fantastical in around every single corner. There are fantastical things happening and, and endless possibilities, but it's also somehow simultaneously completely grounded in reality. The series has so much charm to it, and I'm really, really excited to continue on with it. I'm excited to uh, move on to the next series within the world. That's gonna be awesome. But also, I'm, I have a few videos planned for June to continue talking about this series as well, so there will probably be some more content about this, but I'll also be continuing on with the series because honestly, I've just had a blast. I've just had so much fun reading this, far more than I expected. I thought I was gonna like it the second time around because I read a lot more middle grade now than I used to and I'm enjoying it a lot more and I could just tell that I read the series at the wrong time before and I, I, I felt good about liking it this time around, but I had so much fun reading it and I'm really, really, really excited to continue. Anyway, I would love to continue chatting with you in the comments. Do you love the series? Please tell me why, what it means to you, why you think it's awesome. If you don't like it, you can talk about that too. But I just wanted to talk about all the reasons why I think this series works so well, why it has such a devoted and loyal and strong fan base. And I'm actually really excited for the adaptation now. I am I know Disney Plus is doing an adaptation that will hopefully redeem the other adaptation. I didn't see the other one. But I'm really excited to see what this is gonna look like on screen because this has potential to be a story that would actually make a really, really engaging and fun adaptation. So I'm really, really looking forward to that as well. Anyway, chat with me more in the comments. I post video videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on this channel. Thursdays on the second channel, linked in the description. I'll see you guys again soon, bye.